The scripture this morning is from Luke 23, verses 1 through 25. And the whole multitude of them arose and led him unto Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this man perverting the nation and forbidding to give tribute to Caesar, saying that he himself is Christ, a king. And Pilate asked him, saying, Art thou the king of the Jews? And he answered him and said, Yea, thou sayest it. And then Pilate Then said Pilate to the chief priests and people, I find no fault in this man. And they were more fierce, saying, He stirreth up the people, teaching throughout all Jewry, beginning from Galilee to this place. When Pilate heard of Galilee, he asked whether the man were a Galilean. And as soon as he knew that he belonged under Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who himself also was at Jerusalem at that time. And when Herod saw Jesus, he was exceeding glad, for he was desirous to see him of a long time, because he had heard many things of him and hoped to have seen some miracle done by him. Then he questioned him in many words, but he answered him nothing. And the chief priests and scribes stood and vehemently accused him. And Herod, with his men of war, set him at naught and mocked him, and arrayed him in a gorgeous robe and sent him again to Pilate. And the same day, Pilate and Herod were made friends together, for before this they were at enmity between themselves. And Pilate, when he had called together the chief priests and the rulers and the people, said unto them, You have brought this man unto me as one who perverteth the people. And behold, I, having examined him before you, have found no fault in him, touching those things whereof ye accuse him, no, nor Herod. For I sent you to him, and lo, nothing worthy of death is done unto him. I will therefore chastise him, And release him. For of necessity he must release one unto them at the feast. But they cried out all at once, saying, Away with this man, and release unto us Barabbas, who for a certain sedition made in the city and for murder was cast into prison. Pilate, therefore, willing, to release Jesus, spake again to them. But they cried, saying, Crucify him! Crucify him! And he said unto them the third time, Why? What evil hath he done? I have found no cause of death in him. I will therefore chastise him and let him go. And they were in instant and loud voices, requiring that he might be crucified. And the voices of them and of the chief priests prevailed. And Pilate gave sentence that it should be as they required. And he he released unto them him who for sedition and murder was cast into prison, whom they had desired, and delivered Jesus to their will. Two thousand years ago, in a very small part 
of the Roman Empire, a trial took place, the ramifications of which would alter history indelibly for all time. We're all familiar with the story of what Jesus had to go through after his betrayal in the garden and his mockery of a trial before Annas and Caiaphas. Annas was the father-in-law and counselor to Caiaphas, who was the high priest. Both Annas and Caiaphas had questioned Jesus and had satisfied themselves that he was a blasphemer and pretended to be what he could not possibly be, at least in their small minds. And they led him bound to the palace of Pontius Pilate for Roman justice. Pontius Pilate was a petty Roman official. At that time in the empire, he was known as a prefect. His main responsibility was military. He also collected tribute. And because of that, Annas and Caiaphas assumed that he would pass judgment on Jesus because he encouraged the people not to pay taxes. That was their story. We know Pontius Pilate was a historical figure. There are many records that mention him, and there was an engraving in stone found in 1961 in Caesarea Maritima with his name on it. Pilate had about 3,000 soldiers under his command. And at the time of Jesus' trial, virtually all of them would have been in Jerusalem. It was Passover, the big feast. And the Roman prefect was required to be there in case of an uprising, in case of riot. Pilate also had the power of judicial justice and was the only one in the area who had the power to condemn anyone to death. Pilate was a politician. Now think of that in today's terms. He was a people pleaser. He had a friend in high places, Sejanus, who influenced Tiberius Caesar to appoint Pilate as the prefect of Judea. Pilate would do whatever was necessary to please the Romans and to appease the Jews in Jerusalem. He sought to do those things that would please everyone. Does that sound like a politician? The place where Jesus was tried was called the pavement. That's with a capital P. And in the center of the pavement was the judgment seat where Pilate sat. And a throng packed the pavement, a throng that was undoubtedly influenced, if not hand-picked, by the Sanhedrin. It was orchestrated 
by Annas and Caiaphas. Undoubtedly, there were many who were very active against the Romans and were willing to do as the Sanhedrin directed. We notice in the scripture that Pilate questioned Jesus and was confounded by Jesus because he only gave two short answers. And Pilate was so relieved to find that he was from Galilee, so he sent him to Herod Antipas, hoping that Herod would judge Jesus, find him guilty, send him back to Pilate for the judgment of death. Herod was so pleased to meet Jesus finally. He wanted to see for himself. He wanted Jesus to perform a miracle in his presence. Jesus said nothing. So Herod and his soldiers and his retinue mocked Jesus. They put a gorgeous purple robe on him, mocking him as king of the Jews. Purple is the royal color. And after all this, Herod could do nothing but send him back to Pilate, sent him back without a judgment. Pilate must have been sorely tried. Now he had to make a decision. He questioned Jesus again. And still found nothing in him worthy of death. But the multitude cried out for his crucifixion. If you supply the multitude, would they be inclined to do your bidding? The multitude big as it might have been, was a very small part of the populace, even of Jerusalem, let alone all of Judea. One thing that struck me as particularly interesting is the parallel at this point with two scriptures from the Book of Mormon. The first from Mosiah in the 13th chapter. Now it is not common that the voice of the people desireth anything contrary to that which is right. But it is common for the lesser part of the people to desire that which is not right. Therefore, this shall ye observe, and make it your law to do your business by the voice of the people. And further on, and if the time comes that the voice of the people doth choose iniquity, then is the time that the judgments of God will come upon you. Yea, then is the time he will visit you with great destruction, even as he has hitherto visited this land. They judged Jesus. Pilate judged by the voice of the people who were present. The lesser part of the people. The lesser part convicted Jesus.
in the book of Alma, chapter 8. Yea, well did Mosiah say, who was our last king, when he was about to deliver up the kingdom, having no one to confer it upon, causing that this people should be governed by their own voices. Yea, well did he say that if the time should come, that the voice of this people should choose iniquity, that is, if the time should come that this people should fall into transgression, they would be ripe for destruction. The people chose iniquity. Destruction came upon them in the year 70 AD when the Romans captured and destroyed Jerusalem. It didn't have to happen. Pilate was even warned to have nothing to do with the trial of this just man. The scriptures tell us that Pilate was warm, warned by his wife not to have anything to do with this trial. He was a just man, and she had been warned in a series of dreams. It all came down to the voice of the people who were present, the voice of the people who would speak out. Let me assure you, this is not my lunch. I won't be talking that long. Undoubtedly, right now, you're saying, aha, what in the world is that? Good point. When I thought of what I might say today, and thought about Pilate and the trial of Jesus, I began to consider the connection of the Old and New Testaments, how virtually everything in the Old Testament points to Jesus. The Jews were expecting him Many prophets had foretold of him. In the Old Testament, there are listed 55 prophets. According to the Jewish Talmud, there were hundreds of thousands of prophets. But they were given messages for a specific time, for a specific person or people, for a specific problem. Their prophecies were not recorded. Only the prophecies of the major prophets, the prophecies that, effect, that affected all the people. In the Old Testament, there are 39 books. In case you think I lost my marbles, you're wrong. So all these books point to Jesus. Everything they had spoken came down to the birth the life, the divinity, the message, the trial, 
the suffering, the death, and the resurrection of one man. It all came down and pointed to that. And at this point, in the confluence of all this, Jesus came that we might know his Father, that we might know him, and that salvation through the Father only comes through his Son, Jesus. The trial and crucifixion of Jesus validated all the prophets who had come before. All their words were proven true. Where he was to be born. How he was to live. How he was to die. What he was going to to do for the people. All this is available now as it was then to the people. Made possible by the efforts and the sacrifices of God's holy prophets. But since that time, we have added to the witness. These are the rest of the marbles I didn't lose. In the New Testament, there are 27 books that testify of Jesus. Of necessity, they came after Jesus. But all these books, 66 books, Old and New Testament, testify of Jesus. But that's not all. We have 15 books from where? The Book of Mormon. Another 15 witnesses. All this available to us. But wait, there's one more. What is this witness? Doctrine and Covenants. I don't have enough marbles to go through all the revelations, sections of the Doctrine and Covenants. But that one book contains it all. This is what we have available to us. Old Testament prophets, New Testament witnesses, Book of Mormon prophets and witnesses, Doctrine and Covenants, prophets and witnesses. But why all this emphasis on the trial of Jesus and the role and the character of the judge, Pontius Pilate. Because once again, as always, Jesus is on trial. He's not on trial for his life, but for ours. Our eternal life. This world has been given a wonderful gift, the absolute promise 
of redemption, salvation, and eternal joy with our loving God and creator. The promise that Jesus did not die in vain, but for our salvation from our lives of sin. We are Pontius Pilate. The world is Pontius Pilate. We must judge Christ at his word through the testimonies of his servants and through our own testimonies of his blessings and leadings in our lives. Certainly, we have not the power of life and death over him, but we do have the power of what our lives will be after death. Even Pontius Pilate was warned beforehand not to have anything to do with this just man. And the scriptures bear record that he tried to release Jesus because the apostle John quotes him as saying quite directly, behold, I bring him forth to you that ye may know that I find no fault in him. Will we who have tried to faithfully serve our God listen to the voices who cry out, who scream, crucify him, crucify him, Of course, we no longer use the same words that were used then. What is said is ever so much more subtle, more conniving, more insidious. But the pressure to conform grows stronger day by day. I fear for my daughters. I fear for my grandchildren. I fear for my family, my friends, and my neighbors. I fear for me. Will we succumb to the daily threats and sly innuendos to the tribulations and trials as Pilate did, the hand-picked crowd appearing before Pilate was egged on by someone, probably in authority, shouting, if thou let this man go, thou art not Caesar's friend. Whosoever maketh himself a king speaketh against Caesar. How that must have influenced Pilate to be threatened by the power and authority of Caesar. He owed his job to Caesar. He owed his livelihood. He owed his very life to Caesar. And to say that he was not a friend to Caesar was one of the worst threats he could have gotten. He had to condemn Jesus. But we know he had to condemn Jesus for a different purpose. Without his death, there would be no crucifixion. Without no crucifixion, there would be no triumph over death. There would be no hope. God has given us free agency 
and strong minds and has instructed us to test his word, to try his spirit, to believe in his son. Pilate, as a non-believer, was called upon to judge Christ according to the charges brought against him by the Sanhedrin, who had judged him themselves out of jealousy and pride and ignorance. We cannot ceremoniously wash our hands of him and dismiss him as Pilate must have done following the trial. Outside of the scriptures, Pilate has been forgotten by this world. It is known that he existed. We're told by other sources that Pilate was a cruel man. He was very harsh. He was just downright mean. There was a person in the southern part of Judea who claimed to know where Moses had buried some magical vessels that contained who knows what. He attracted a lot of people down there. And where the people went, the Romans went. And things got out of hand, and the soldiers killed a lot of those people there. The procurator of Syria heard about this, sent word to Rome. Caesar, Tiberius Caesar, recalled Pilate to answer charges against him. Tiberius died before Caesar could make it to Rome. Unfortunately for him, the next ruler was Caligula. And if you know anything about Roman history, Caligula was worse than Pilate ever hoped to be. Pilate died in 39 AD. And there is some doubt as to how he died. Many scholars believe that he committed suicide at the orders of Caligula. Some say he was simply killed. Some of them are very fanciful. He was killed, his body thrown in the Tiber River. The Tiber was so disturbed that they had to fish his body out and find someplace else to put it. That's what happened to the man who condemned Jesus. The time is soon coming when we must judge Jesus and serve him wholly and place him in the center of our hearts and thoughts. May God bless us in the time ahead and give us the strength and courage to judge all things wisely and choose the only eternal hope. God will take care of us. Be not afraid.